And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Sharon Solomon. I had the pleasure of first meeting Sharon in the 70s. I think it was approximately 1975, wasn't it, Sharon? And immediately upon meeting her, I felt a kindred soul, a sister, you know, the cousin you hadn't met yet. And I just somehow knew in my soul we were meant to work together and play together and learn together. And we've continued to do that for these many, many years. And of course, we're still very young, aren't we? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but anyway, Sharon has helped so many people. And it's, it's behind the scenes a lot of the time. But she's also been in front of the scenes on top of the scenes, under the scenes. She's done just about every job you can think of at the fellowship, officially and unofficially. And she just hangs in there no matter what's happening. And she's one of those people who gives from her heart and her soul and is there for you at the soul level. And, and she has a, I think she has a wonderful sense of humor too. I laugh really well with Sharon. And so we're just so grateful that you came to the fellowship and that you married Paul Solomon and that you continue doing the work that you're doing. And I know she's going to inspire us today with what she has to share about Paul Solomon and his teachings. So Sharon, come on up. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank okay. you. Last week on July 7th was Paul Solomon's birthday. Had he lived, he would have been 83 years old. Each year for Paul's birthday, we would have a big party with great food, balloons, silly presents, singing, skits, testimonials. He, it was a family time and everyone was welcome. I'd like to continue the tradition of celebrating Paul's birthday, so I try to schedule a talk around this time each year to bring Paul back to life for all of you, our fellowship family. Paul said, our true mission is to build a beautiful family, a real family of people who feel related to each other. The family must extend across religious walls and barriers. This family must reach across socioeconomic and class barriers. We must reach and encompass the poor and the sick, the criminals and the insane. Every person on the planet needs to know that someone cares. I do believe that we have built a beautiful family here in Virginia Beach, and that family stretches around the world. There's a fellowship in Japan, Inner Light Consciousness, the guided experience and spiritual evolution created by Paul is shared by guides throughout Europe, though often by different names. We get emails from the Middle East, from South Africa, even from Russia, of people encountering the works of Paul Solomon through CDs, books, and especially through websites on the internet. In his lifetime, Paul touched hundreds of thousands of individuals through his lectures, workshops, newsletters, books, and now through the internet. People's lives have been transformed through Paul's teachings and inspired through his descriptions of developing a personal relationship with the source of our being. We can talk about the thousands of people who have been helped by Paul's work, and yet, Maybe even more important for us is the one-on-one -on -one relationships that he encouraged. In one of the most quoted readings, the Paul Solomon source said, it is necessary that you express the highest that is within you, creating in this world places of light to which men will be drawn for the love that is shared. Then share have fun, smile, and lift the hearts of one another. Lift the burdens off one another's back until all the world knows and the stories become legendary among you that here are people who have an ability to replace the burden with a smile. 
so that men call them healers, little lights, candles, new lights in the world, little Christs. Then come together and let it be said about you, see how they love one another. Nearly 30 years ago, the fellowship held a seminary program in Virginia Beach, in which about 30 men and women from Japan attended. Many were ordained as fellowship ministers. After the program, the group formed a fellowship in Japan and called it Filling, Fellowship of the Inner Light International Nippon Group. After the seminary program, Paul and I spent three months together with the group in Japan. He died a year later, but as a result of that experience, I have been invited to Japan many times through the years. Uh, as you know, just this past few days, the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, was assassinated. And um, it happened in a, a little town uh, of Nara, which I've been to many times. It's a small town. It is an old capital, one of the first capitals of Japan. And um, it's, it's a beautiful place where there's a, a really big Buddha and the streets are really narrow in the cars. You know, you walk through and you see the ancient sites and, and it's a special town because the deer walk with you. So you're walking down the shopping district and a deer can be sitting alongside of you on the road and if you feed them, they follow you and they butt you and they want more. But this is the little town where that assassination happened. And um, this is, you know, Japan is one of the safest places in the world because they have very strict gun laws and also um, there's very, you know, there's a, most of the Japanese people feel like they're one family and, and they feel akin to one another. So it's a real shock for this to happen in this beautiful, peaceful place. And um, I, let's, let's just take, uh, you know, and they, they're saying on the news now that um, for Japan, for the people there, the assassination of Shinto, Shinzo Abe is like, for them, like the assassination of President Kennedy was for us. It destroys the whole fabric of belief in, the, in their society. And um, so I'd like to just take maybe a minute, just focus on Japan and the people there and send your love and healing to all the people there. Father, we ask that the love in this room spread around the world to the people in Japan, our brothers and sisters, our, our fellowship family who live there. And we ask that the whole country experience a healing. And through this tragedy, let the light shine through and let the be, people be lifted up in love and in peace. Thank you. Amen. So uh, many of you have asked about uh, my trip to Japan, so I thought I would this would be a good time to talk a little bit about the highlights. Um, this year, as you know, was the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Fellowship of the Inner Light in the United States. It was also the 30th anniversary of the founding of the fellowship in Japan. The Japanese fellowship offers a two-year program of inner light consciousness, the essential teachings of Paul Solomon, with monthly weekend workshops. This program also includes study of Kabbalah, mostly based on the teachings of Zen Ben Shimon Halevi, a teacher from England who wrote many books on Kabbalah. They also study astrology, tarot, and teachings of many of the great masters of spiritual teachings from around the world. They also study the deeper meanings of their own Shinto and Buddhism spiritual practices, which are shared by ILC guides who have studied with masters of their own culture through the years. And we've invited uh, several of the people who are teaching the deeper mysteries of Shinto and Buddhism to come to our next year's family gathering. 
and uh, they've accepted. So our next family gathering, which uh, Stephen Poplin and I are facilitating, will be based on this being an interfaith fellowship. And we're going to have speakers talk about all the different religions and cultures from around the world. Um, we have uh, the head of the fellowship is definitely coming. The, the former head of the fellowship, Hiromi Matsumoto, is having some health problems. So we need to keep her in our prayers that she'll be able to come too. But we're really excited about that. And after the two-year program, the Japan Fellowship offers a week-long residential program of advanced inner light consciousness. And that's when I come to Japan to share Paul's teachings. The residential program is held in Koyasan, a thousand-year-old Buddhist city high in the mountains. You have to get there by cable car. And it's, the program is held in a Buddhist temple. Koyasan was founded by a Buddha named Kobodais whose undecaying body lies in a shrine around a sacred forest and sanctuary visited by thousands of pilgrims each year. The essence of Kobodais' teaching says, and this is a vast simplification in my understanding, is that you can be the Buddha in this very life. And, and that fits with the teachings here at the fellowship and uh, with many of the other spiritual teachers because as Paul Solomon says, all the gods are one God. The Christ lives within you, and you and I have the potential to become the very living, the very Christ, living love alive in this very life. Or in the words of Diane Fortune, a mystic of the 20th century, she said, all the gods are one God, and all the goddesses are one goddess. And the teachings of Jesus Christ, when he said, all these things that I do, you can do also, and greater things than these can you do. Or as is said in the most holy prayer of Judaism, hear, of Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That prayer is often uh, cited as a testimony, a testament for monotheism, but it doesn't say there is one God. It says in translation that God is one. That means we are one. And, through the, and though the fellowship has no doctrine or dogma, there is a general understanding that we are one. We are an interfaith fellowship, acknowledging that at the basis of every religion and culture that has lasted through its centuries, there was an individual who touched the essence of who and what God is, the source of our being, a most high God, and a personal God with whom we can get to know and communicate with. As we grow in our relationship with Source, we get to know ourselves and our God better. That is our goal each and every day. So when I go to Japan, we share with one another and get to know God, the source of our being, and get to know one another. On this past trip, I didn't get to go to Skoyasan because of COVID restrictions. But I spent about five weeks teaching classes and visiting sacred sites. One of the classes I shared was called the Powerful Woman Workshop, which actually included three men, too. We studied deeper meanings of the goddesses of different cultures and came to the conclusion that the power, true power, comes only through self-mastery. I also shared classes in effective communication the Tarot, and did Tarot readings and shared stories about Paul Solomon, and met with filling members who had been a part of the fellowship for the past 30 years. All of my classes are based on Paul's teachings, and in previous years I have shared teachings of emotions, self-love, Bible, self-talk, relationships, nature spirits, and of course meditation and developing a personal relationship with Source, to name a few. Each time I go to Japan, I visit the temple of the Buddhist monk Sukasawa-san. In his temple are the ashes of Paul Solomon in a very sacred space. And Sukasawa-san delivers a sutra to honor Paul's memory. One time, observing the anniversary of Paul's death, one of the ILC practitioners 
led a group up the seven terraces to a higher consciousness, the meditation technique developed by Paul and that we do each Sunday before the service here. When we reached the seventh terrace and were entering the temple, the physical temple that we were in began to shake. It was an earthquake and there was no damage. The earthquake that day happened only in that temple. We interpreted it as a loving greeting from Paul Solomon from the realms of heaven. Also in Japan, I love riding on the bullet, bullet train and on a clear day you can see Mount Fuji for miles and miles as the train speeds through from Tokyo to Kyoto to Osaka, our destination. And, and I was going to talk about how I love the city of Nara, and I do love the city of Nara. It's a really special place, and I love it especially because the deer walk with you. And each time we, we feed the deer, and, um, and they do follow us. Also in this past visit, I went to a city which has a sanctuary with sculptures of the 500 bodies of the Buddha. They're small, sculptures of monks with many different facial expressions and body postures. One Buddha has a heart that he holds in his hand, the essence of love, a reminder that within each of us lives the Buddha, the Christ, and that we are one. Hiromi Matsumoto, the founder of Filling, and I often marvel at the directions our lives have taken. I was born a Jewish girl from a middle-class family in the, suburb, the New Jersey suburbs of New York City. And she was a former middle school teacher of English. And here we are, spreading the great teachings of the masters around the world. I think that alone would be a miracle. But I have been privileged to witness many miracles through the years, through being a student and then the wife of Paul Solomon. I first experienced inner light consciousness as a class with Paul Solomon in Wayne, New Jersey in 1975. In that class, Paul offered me a job as a secretary and I moved to Virginia Beach in October of that year. I would like to tell you about some miracles that I personally witnessed. Miracles, Paul said, are not unusual. They are brief openings in the time-space continuum, barriers. What is unusual is that you would notice them. Some of these miracles, especially the first one I will tell you about, I didn't really recognize until years later. The first reading I witnessed by Paul was for a young man who was studying for his doctorate. But as he was studying, suddenly his mind would become fuzzy and he couldn't think clearly. He also had respiratory problems. The reading said that he was allergic to dairy products and they were creating problems with his breathing and focus. At the time, I was also suffering from asthma. I knew nothing about food allergies. When I had trouble breathing, I had gotten milk, soft cheese, or ice cream, all dairy products, because those things were cooling to my throat. In the synchronicity of the universe, that reading had addressed my health problems as well as the seeker who had gotten the readings, and I was able to stop suffering from asthma in that time. As some of you know, Sharon is not my given name. Many of us in the fellowship were given baptismal names in the biblical tradition of changing one's name to build a new life. In the tradition of Ab becoming Abraham, Jacob becoming Israel, Saul becoming Paul. Paul Solomon was given his name by source to encompass the tradition of Old and New Testament, meaning expositor of wisdom. I was given the name Sharon Ramoth in a reading by Paul. 
Now, to understand what's remarkable about this is you should know that as a Jewish child, I was given a Hebrew name as well as an English name at birth. One day, Susan Thomas and I were fooling around and saying our names backwards. I realized that the name given to me by source contained the same Hebrew letters as the name given to me at birth, only backwards. So that numerologically, I carried the same letters, the same vibration since birth. Working as Paul's secretary during the first few weeks of my coming to Virginia Beach, I was approaching my car one day when I heard Paul call me, although he was several blocks away at the fellowship building. I went back to the fellowship building and he was calling me in his mind because he needed someone to transcribe a reading that night. Needless to say, I stayed and transcribed the reading. One of my favorite jobs at the fellowship still is, is transcribing Paul's readings and lectures. It happened with me and others who also transcribed the readings that the readings we were given to transcribe would invariably address a question they had thought about regarding our own lives. When Paul gave a lecture, often people would come up to him afterwards and say, I had this question and you just answered it. It seems that the lecture you gave must have been just especially for me. That happened quite often. Paul channeled his lectures as well as his readings. It was Source who answered the people's questions. Paul spoke the words given to him by Source, and many of us felt that we were given personal, individual messages. Some of you recognize that. I was Paul's student for many years before I became his wife. During that time, we had opportunities to have private meetings with Paul to ask him questions about his life and work. I always had lots of questions. Before my appointment, I'd make a long list of the questions and bring my list eager for answers. But what happened was, on several occasions, I would go for my appointment, I would look at my questions, and they were no longer questions. I sat in his office and suddenly everything became clear. I didn't have to ask anything because I would get this feeling of wonder and awe is the only way I can describe it. There was a presence about Paul that would uplift the consciousness into a feeling of oneness where no questions exist, as was my experience. Um, however, that lasted for a day or two and then I looked at my questions and they were back. The house on 37th Street in Virginia Beach was an old house, and Paul lived there for a time. All too often, the electric would go out and we couldn't get it back on. There was one night when Judy Scutch and other people from the Course in Miracles were coming to visit, and the lights had gone off. There was a fireplace in the living room, and I was cleaning there in the dark. Person after person would frantically come into the living room and try to get the fire going. No one was successful. Then Paul came in. He didn't say a word, but he reached out his hand like this over the fire, and poof, the fire sprang up in the fireplace. He looked at me and smiled, not saying a word. One time, I had a migraine headache. I was laying in my bed asking God and Paul to heal me. I fell asleep, and when I awoke, the headache was gone. The next morning, Paul told me I had come into his room in my astral body and asked, me to heal, asked him to heal me, and he did. I had no memory of that. One day, a group of us were sitting around the table, and Paul was ringing a bell. He said when he rang the bell, one of his students heard and got in touch with him. He rang the bell. 
the phone rang, and it was that student on the telephone. The student was in California at the time, and we were in Virginia. Another time, one of the students were talking, was talking on the telephone, and Paul said to hang up because someone was trying to call him, and it was important. She continued to talk on the phone, and suddenly the phone clicked off. It was disconnected. As soon as it did, the phone rang again, and indeed, it was another of Paul's students. He was at the airport and had lost his car keys and needed help. One time, Paul told us he wanted to get in touch with a man who lived in Texas, and no one had the phone number. Paul said we had to find him. It took several days, but we finally found his phone number. When we reached him, he said he had been jumping up and down on his trampoline, calling Paul's name because he wanted to find Paul, but didn't know how to get in touch with him. One time, we were cooking together in the kitchen at Hearthfire Lodge. I spilled hot grease all over my chest, and it got under my thin blouse. Blisters popped up immediately, and it really hurt. Paul put out his hand, and the pain went away immediately, and the blister disappeared. We were in Switzerland where Paul was doing lectures and workshops. John Christian was with us. We were riding home, and the car kept stalling out. Then it didn't start at all. Paul told the man who was driving us that he could get the car moving again if he would drive it. So Paul got behind the wheel and drove the car to the hotel where we were staying. When we got to the hotel, Paul told the driver to get the car fixed before he picked us up in the morning. He said the car would run and get him home, but it wouldn't start the next day. The next morning, we got a phone call. It was the driver saying he would be late. He had been convinced the car was fixed because it ran so beautifully the night before, but in the morning, it wouldn't start. We were in Texas visiting Paul's parents, and we were on our way to the airport. We had stopped at a rest stop, and there was a man there with the hood of the car open, and he was looking forlornly at the engine. Paul was always helpful to strangers, and of course he asked if he could help. Paul didn't know how to fix a car, but he looked at the engine with the man. Then he told the man to go and try and start the car, and when he did, the engine started right up. The man thanked him and drove away. I asked Paul what he did, and he said, I asked the divas of the car to drive the car and it worked. Paul was far ahead of his time in many of his teachings. One of them, which was closest to his heart, was his desire to form an organization called Dignity International. This organization would focus on human rights around the world. The immediacy of focus was the plight of the sex slaves that he encountered in his travels, particularly at that time in Thailand. At that time, there was little notice around the world of the continued practice of slavery, particularly of underprivileged men and women. He brought attention to this human rights abomination in his workshops and lectures. One lecture he entitled, Never, Ma Never Leave a Man a Slave When You Can Set Him Free. Now, almost 30 years since Paul's death, there is a great movement to help these suffering individuals. I noticed on CNN International, when I was recently in Japan, that there is repeated focus on helping for those unfortunate individuals, and many people have taken up the cause to help them. For me, the greatest miracle was marrying Paul. And I think if I could have, I would have stopped time to that day. I have had the opportunity since his death to be one of the people to continue his work. The work goes on, and the Paul Solomon material is now in the upper room of the Fellowship of the Inner Light. We are finding ways of making the teachings more available. 
Also, there were several websites with Paul's teachings, and I recommend that you look them up and research his teachings there. I have been asked many times, and I have wondered, especially since Paul died, how to describe Paul as a teacher, as a man, as a master. As his wife, I see him through eyes of love. I know I have been suspect because my love for him certainly influences my opinion in his favor. Then I found this description that he gave of Mahatma Gandhi, and I think it is perfect description of Paul as well. Paul said, Mahatma Gandhi was without question a great man. He was a man who lived his life in such a way as to change the course of history. Was Gandhi another incarnation of Christ? The truth is probably this. For a few hours or a few days, on a few different occasions in his life, Gandhi was Christ. These hours or days on few occasions were followed by human inadequacy. So he was the Christ for a moment, incarnate, alive, changing history. And a moment later, another breath, he was back into his unworthy self and knew it. And he taught it that way to his followers. So may have a number of men or women who have been for a moment that perfection of who they are. And if they are at any given moment, only for 60 seconds, even for one split second, if we taste perfection, we taste who we are. And who we are is Christ. Paul Solomon taught that that moment is possible for each of us. Paul's teachings were practical, relevant for everyday life, and how to live in supportive lifestyle for ourselves and everyone we knew. No one was a stranger, and it was not unusual for me to come home and find a person Paul had just met sitting in our living room and sharing a meal. He didn't require that people believe as he did, or even as he taught. In every experience of inner light consciousness, he explained, none of this may be true, but it serves me to believe it and live accordingly. Of course, he did believe in the truth of his teachings, and so did many of his students. He taught that we can live in heaven on earth. It is our choice. He taught that we can change the world, that Christ can be born again today in any one of us. We can experience the new heaven and the new earth, the thousand years of peace, as talked of in the Bible. But the way that that will come is by living in a way that spreads joy, love, peace, getting along with one another, caring and loving one another. Maybe none of us is there yet, but within each of us is the potential. By choosing love over fear, we can create a new heaven and a new earth right here today. One of my favorite excerpts from the Paul Solomon source is a passage which we call Awakened Sleeping Gods. And this is the passage. Look and see that all those about you are as sleeping gods, and your purpose is to cry them awake, for the time is at hand. Awaken God in the heart of every man and woman you see, not placing him here, not lighting the light, but rather point to, bring attention to, cause consciousness of that light that is innate within each of us. Cause them to awaken to themselves and to shake off the dust of the earth, to shake off these physical bodies that are the dust of the earth, and to rejoice, crying out, and to return to the Father. There are all, these are all a portion of the same family, and in coming together, a portion of the same body. And so will that giant body of God arise, and in shaking the dust of the earth from itself, 
will rise up in glory, in power, in might, in light upon this plain. So this plain will be shaken, this earth will be changed, transmuted to a plain of light that would be as the footstool of God. Mm -hmm. We are very blessed to be a part of this fellowship family. Thank you.